Okay, I'm Dennis Province from the IDEA National Resource for Quantitative Proteomics, and I'm making this video to explain a little bit about the Spectronaut viewer, that if you do a data independent acquisition experiment with us, you'll receive your data back um, with our differential analysis, but we'll also send you a Spectronaut file, which is a .sne file, and I wanted to go through um, just kind of what you can, how to navigate through some of this. So to open up this file, you'll have to go to the Biognosis website and you'll have to uh, request uh, the viewer. Um, they'll send the, you a link and a, and a key. And uh, once you install that and you open that up, usually this is the first uh, screen that you'll see. It will have... Um, uh, a series of uh, tabs across the top here, and it'll start in the analysis tab. And as it loads, you'll be see each sample load in here. Um, and uh, um, so we're just going to start here. This this uh, window down below, which is called the analysis summary, is uh, really if I um, do this with both the up and the lower window, it will just expand that up here. The analysis summary will tell me the number of precursors that I have for any particular sample that I have selected here. This particular um, set of data is just some HeLa samples that I had uh, versus some JJN3. They're two different um, cancer cell lines. And uh, so because they're different um, types of cells, uh, there's going to be lots of different uh, uh, proteins expressed here. And so you can see that the number of precursors, and if you're curious about words like precursors and the difference between modified peptides and peptides, uh, Biognosis has done a really good job in their uh, Spectronaut software to have little pop-ups that give you information about these different things. The number of protein groups that we have uh, out of the total number of protein groups, the number of proteins... Um, and uh, lots of lots of QC data here that you can look at, um, and uh, I'm not going to go through that uh, any more than just to let you know that that's here under the analysis summary. So um, one of the things you like to do is to go to the post analysis uh, where there's some more uh, QC metrics here that you can look at and uh, they um, uh, under identifications, but I like to go to run identifications here. And as it loads in my data, it's just a quick way for me to look and see, I had a couple of different experiments here going on. I would have HeLa cells versus JJN3. And I also did a couple of different uh, DIA data collection methods. One was called no staggered where where the windows were not staggered and the other one, the windows were staggered. And so I'm just looking at, at, at those uh, five samples and uh, replicates for each one. And you can see right away that all my HeLa um, samples uh, had quite a bit of different loading than my JJN3 did. But there are a couple of different cell lines that were uh, digested at different times and uh, and so there is there's some variability there down here at the bottom. It has uh, some information. You can kind of move these around where it has a lot of that same information in a table form that you can look at to see the number of precursors or peptides or protein groups or whatever for each um, individual run that you have here. <clears throat> there is. Um, uh, one of the things that people like to do is to, to dive into their data uh, a little bit more. So uh, just another quality control thing before I move on, if I go to this tick overlay plot here, this is something that's kind of interesting because it will show me what the, uh, what the chromatogram is for all of my runs all overlaid on top of each other. And so sometimes if there's a, a sample that uh, looks a little, doesn't seem to match well. Um, I can come here and you can see that maybe there was a loading issue. Maybe one of the samples uh, just didn't have a, as the same amount of 
uh, peptides loaded is, is the others, either because of some sort of issue with the auto sampler or, or something like that. And so um, you can see that uh, easily here. Uh, also, if you come down here to principal component analysis, you can see uh, if you have included your groups um, um, when you load it in your data, which usually we do, it will separate those guys but, uh, in a PCA plot. And you can see the difference between the, the HeLa and the JJN3 and the difference between the, the staggered and the no staggered for these guys. So all of that's great, but really none of this information is stuff that as a biologist, you might, you might be interested in this some, but what you'd want to do is be able to go and to analyze for a specific protein, maybe that you found off of your volcano plot that looks really interesting. So if I come back here, um, I do want to point out there are volcano plots. So let's say you come here and you, you want to look at the difference between Gila staggered and no staggered. And you can see some of these guys here. If you hover over it, it gives you some of that annotation for these guys that are either upregulated or downregulated um, for these different group comparisons here. And so let's say, uh, for instance, you wanted to go and look at one of these guys here. There's a, a gene that you're looking for and you want to just see what the data looks like. And you've been kind of intimidated because you don't really know what you're looking at. Well, let me just give you a couple of minutes here to walking you through this and maybe it'll make you a little bit more comfortable. So over here on the side, you got the tree view and you've got the grid view. If you come to the grid view, you can see right away that we have a lot more information. This is uh, down the side here. We've got the, the, the protein labels here. Um, we've got the, the samples up here on the top. And then these numbers here are normalized intensities uh, for these different proteins. And they're split apart by, you know, the different replicates that we have, the HeLa no staggered, the HeLa staggered, et cetera. And let's just come down here one that where you can see some, some variability here. You can see some difference between on this particular protein right here. Now looking over here and I'm like, ah, man, that protein label looks kind of rough. I'd really like gene name there. If I go up here on the top and I right click, you can come here and go to column chooser. And if I go to gene IDs, maybe. Yeah, then it pops up. Here's my gene IDs as well. And so uh, let me get rid of this little guy here. And uh, we can, um, yeah, get my protein labels back here. Um, and so now I have my gene IDs and I can even move this over just a little bit here. And you've got these sorting functions here. If there's a certain gene that you're looking for, um, you can uh, click on this little guy and you can put filters here. Um, starts with, ends with, equals, you know, all these sorts of things. And, um, and that's, that's really helpful. Um, and all that comes, comes from there. So anyway, I, I kind of lost my, uh, I kind of lost my, my grouping here a little bit. Maybe it will let me do this. It doesn't matter. I'll choose a different one. So let's say we're interested in this particular um, protein right here, even though I don't have a gene uh, ID because they all went away. Let me let me click on this again. There we go. OK, that works. I'm going to come up here and look at this guy. So let's say this is one I'm interested in here. Uh, I don't even know what this gene is, but it looks like it is differentially expressed here. So I'm going to click on one of these guys here. And it shows me some information over here. This is the actual primary sequence for that particular protein. And you can see that there's some green um, underlines uh, for different peptides that it found. Um, and if I click on that, it'll show me that spectral information down here. You can also see that there's some red ones. And it says that it, this one was not identified. Well, how would it know it's there if it's not identified? It's because it wasn't identified in this sample, but it was identified in what some of these other samples. So you can tell that in the JJN3 sample, some of these genes uh, or some of these pro these peptides here are higher uh, 
abundance. And so they're found there. So if I look at one of these guys, you can see that I'm getting some spectral information down here below. And this is kind of what I want to show you here is how we can look at this. So you've got these whole upper panel and lower panel, and it says protein coverage up here, which is what we got here. And then precursor, I'm going to go through some of these guys uh, with you here. And so if I go to, um, first of all, if I click on one of these guys like this, and I just want to zoom in on this particular uh, peptide, let's just show you that. So it tells me what peptide, what protein this peptide came from, and then it tells me the actual sequence. So this actually uh, has a methionine that's been uh, been oxidated here, and it uh, is a plus two charge is what that, that dot two means. It gives me a PEP score and a Q value, and those things, as you'll notice as you go through um, the, they will tell you something about the quality of the, the spectra that we have here. So what we're looking at in this upper panel and the lower panel, this upper panel shows you the MS2, uh, what are called XICs. So this is the, um, the spectra of the different fragments. And it even tells me for by the color, so the red would be the Y6 ion. It's a plus one ion. And... Uh, then you'd have a Y4 ion here and a Y7 ion, et cetera, et cetera, that are found in the MS2 mode. And then down below the MS. So in other words, if we're just looking at that same retention time and we're finding the mass of this peptide at the plus two uh, charge, uh, that mass over charge, it's telling you what the uh, monoisotopic um, signature is and then your if you have one carbon 13 or two carbon 13s or whatever and what those guys are and so let's say i want to dig into that once i clicked on that you'll notice that it it kind of went down and it changed over here now instead of having uh just um all the information we had before that was uh specific to it's open this up on this particular uh, sample to the specific protein that I'm looking at, and then it's actually opened it up to the specific peptide in that protein that I'm looking at in that particular sample. And it gets even better. If I click on this guy here, it's now telling me the exact mass of the peptide that we're looking at, and it gets better. If I click on that peptide, it now shows me the fragments, okay, as, as it um, used some high energy dissociation to blow apart those, frag those peptides into fragments. It's telling me what the fragments are. And up at the top here, it's showing me uh, what those look like as they're coming out, as they're getting, as those ions are, 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 are being fragmented and it's getting a signature for each one of those. And then down below, it's telling me, well, here's the mass that we expected it to be and the mass uh, predicted and the mass that we actually measured um, for uh, the, and again, because uh, we have the monoisotopic mass and then we've got the mass when you have one carbon uh, 13 and then another carbon 13 in there. And so you can see that even in some of these fragments, there's different colors because it actually used for quantitation those three fragments. Those are the best three fragments that it used the area underneath the curve here for quantitation. So you can see this great big red guy here. And so sometimes people have mentioned uh, the number of points um, across the peak. And this is where this is the most important. For quantitation, we are measuring quantitation by finding the area underneath this peak. And so the more this looks like a Gaussian peak, because we have lots of measurements, lots of data points here, the better the quantitation is. The more it looks like just a triangle, because we only have one or two points underneath the peak, the worse the... Uh, the, the bigger the error is as we calculate that air uh, that area underneath the peak. And so you can see that it had lots of, uh, it had six different fragments that it could measure for this particular peptide. 
And you'll notice that that's just one peptide for this protein. There's another uh, peptide here. And underneath that guy is even more fragments that we can look at and, uh, and see which ones they used. And so the whole idea is for, is for me uh, giving this video is to give a biologist that's looking at this data and maybe you saw something, this particular protein is, is, is really different and you didn't expect it to be. And you're trying to figure out, well, is this real? How real is this? Well, uh, based upon the analysis here, we have um, for this particular protein, there are three peptides that were found that all have quantitation to it. Now, you'll notice that two of these peptides are the same peptide, but they have different charges. So that, um, uh, that's what the difference between the two here and the three here. And then this other peptide is something different completely. Uh, it's a different peptide. So really, uh, most of the time people will ask the question, how many peptides do I need to be able to validate that protein using proteomics? Well, uh, most of the time it's two. You need two peptides to be able to, that, that you, to verify and then uh, that that peptide, a protein is actually present. And so this is just uh, one shot at it here. So I, I want to show you something else that you can do over here as we finish up. And uh, this is kind of a sneaky place to put it. But if you click on this little arrow here, uh, the arrow down arrow here, it says that you have lots of different things that you can look at for the run specific information. And uh, we could go through all of these different things. But I want to show you this thing. If we go across run, and then I choose one of these guys, you see what it did here? It now has given me, for that particular peptide that I have, that I'm still looking at, it is showing me from run to run to run, all, in this case, all of the different values that we get for the different fragments that it found. And these guys uh, over here were all the JJ and three samples and over here, they're all the HeLa samples. So this protein is, is much more upregulated in my JJ and three samples. And you can see that quite clearly. And so that's, that's really neat to be able to go across run and look at some of these guys here. Um, you can see this is where it's overlaying them all one on top of each other. So this is actually the quantities that it's um, having. And, and if you go and look at the colors here, all of the HeLa, the levels are really low, and then all the JJ and 3s are, are up here. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's a really neat um, that you can look at. And this is another way of looking at it here, where it is basically showing you the, the same plot that I have up here, only it's showing it for every single sample. And if I click on here, it will switch and show me up here in the top what I'm looking at uh, down here in the bottom. And so this is a way that is a, you know, as a PI, you're, you've got lots of different skill sets and things that you're thinking about and you're doing a proteomic experiment and you want to make sure that um, you have the confidence that your proteomic experiment is actually showing you some real data. Of course, you're going to need to probably do some other, you're, you're definitely going to need to do some other validation, Western blots and some other things. Um, but you can be confident here that these signals are real if we see them over and over again in, in across these replicates. And then you see that they've, they've completely disappeared in these other, um, in these other sets. So that's uh, one really powerful tool with the Spectronaut data is that you have the spectral level data for all of the fragments and the peptides that go into those proteins. Not just the, um, you know, if I, if, if I could flip back over here again, not just the, 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 the one data point here on a volcano plot, but also uh, being able to look back at this information here 
uh, gives you a lot of value to that as to, as to how real that is. So hopefully this is helpful to you um, as you go forward in your analysis.